the event to begin to our moderators. Thank you, Kara. Hello, Hoya Nation. It is Dan Helfrich alongside uh, Tom Greaser. For those new to the program, and I know we have some new folks here, along with many stalwart Hoya supporters, um, Tom and I graduated together in the 90s. Tom was a highly decorated striker. I was a very mediocre defender. And uh, we've been broadcasting uh, the Georgetown games for close to 20 years now. And uh, obviously last year was a thrill. And uh, join us, Coach Weiss. Brian, where are you right now? I'm over here. I'm, speaker view puts me on the screen if you've done it correctly, I think is what I've been told. And where are you physically? <laughs> <laughs> physically, physically. Oh, uh, I am, I am uh, in, in London. I've, I've flown across uh, the pond um, and uh, quarantining here for two weeks before um, I get the uh, privilege of, of embedding with the Wickham Wanderers, which is a championship um, level club that is owned by the Kuwigs, who are Georgetown uh, uh, alums, and, and uh, Pete has kindly offered for me to come over and, and embed with them um, for, uh, for a couple of weeks and, and hopefully pick up, uh, pick up a couple of good ideas from them um, during the fall. Love it. And uh, we'll be joined by uh, Captain Rio Hope Gund along the way. But Brian, I, I think the best place to start is sort of a current status of where things are. Um, you're in London, uh, where you expected to be in, in mid-September. I, I just want to get people up to speed on program status, um, prospects for the spring, and maybe, you know, where the guys are right now. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I think um, the guys the guys are sort of always sort of front of mind for us, um, and uh, you know we we are still in a holding pattern for playing, as I'm sure everyone knows. I think um, uh, we are uh, expecting um, to play proper games in the spring, and uh, sort of playing it to be honest week by week, um, as as a lot of people are in this whole situation. But I think the um, uh, the team is, is more or less split and, and Rio can speak to this a little bit. There's a decent number of the guys that are back in the DC area, um, studying, stu uh, remotely, uh, but they're, but they're socially able to, to see each other and, um, and maybe play some pickup and, and trying to stay uh, mentally sane, uh, by, uh, by not, um, uh, being in their bedrooms or basements for this, for this semester. And then, you know, uh, a decent number of guys are our home. A lot of our freshmen are home because they have playing situations that make some sense for them to, to keep playing and ticking over. So, um, you know, it's, it's, um, we, we're in a really interesting situation where a lot of the country, even though nobody is playing this fall, uh, a lot of the country is training, right? So if they're on campus, they're able to practice even though they can't play games. And that's something that we're not, as a, as a, as a university, in a position to do just yet. And so our guys are really challenged with, with trying to, to – um, balance being safe and healthy with, uh, with, with, with keeping up with um, what our co competitors are doing. And, and, and to be fair, uh, just seeing each other and, 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 uh, um, and continuing to move forward as best they can in the situation. So it, it's still a very much a scattershot sort of scenario for them. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we will meet uh, currently once a week as a, as a team uh, and go over odds and bobs uh, that make some sense for, for what we're doing. And, um, uh, but to be fair, and I, I think Rio on here is a great, um, uh, player to have on the call because our captains are really the ones who, who are doing a lot of, of programming and, and, uh, 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 and sort of team uh, functions at the moment for us in, in, in our place. And Brian, when we did this in the spring, you talked about the importance of the team being physically fit and, Hearing that Georgetown isn't in a place where the team can get together and train together, but the majority of the Big East, virtually all of the ACC and other schools are, in addition to that physical fitness, and you and I have talked a lot about this and we've seen stuff, you know, at high profile, you know, professional athletes talk about this, how difficult, it, difficult it, is it for the mental health aspect for the team to know they can't do anything formally and other teams are doing that right now. 
I, I mean, to be honest, I think it's really tough. I think it's very, very tough. I, I think you're, you're kidding yourselves if, if, if you're saying that our guys um, who are highly motivated um, Division One athletes that love their sport, um, to be fair, that, that love being together. I, think, I don't think I've ever had a group of guys that enjoyed each other's company um, as much as this current group does. Um, it, it's, it's incredibly difficult. And, and, and we've actually – um, you know, started our meetings, you know, uh, we're, we're actually doing a, quite a few things, but one of the, the primary goals for us is to get Dr. Erica Force involved with the team who's, um, uh, does sports psychology for our department. Um, and so she laid, we had a meeting with her on sat on uh, last Sunday to, to talk about some of the struggles that they're going to have in that exact area, Tom. Um, and then, uh, next Sunday we're following up and doing another one, um, just to talk about motivation, talk about how to make the best of the situation, um, you know, handling the struggles that they're going to be handling. It's, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's the challenge that we have right now. Right. You, you mentioned the potential, and then we'll bring Rio into the, of sort of a proper season in the spring, or at least getting to play some matches. Some people probably saw the news, but many have not. Do you want to describe what the sort of Division One committee came out with that at least is a straw for, what a season and a potential chance to defend a national championship might look like in the spring? Yeah, it, it's, it's um, you know, they're trying to run it as much uh, at, at like a fall would be as they can. Right. And so um, it's, it's a funny, it's a funny environment for it because it's, it's something that's never been done before. Um, but um, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out the best way of, of, of making this work. They've given, um, every player a, 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 an extra year of eligibility after the spring if they choose to, to they, they want it, whether you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior, um, <clears throat> which um, uh, which is which is an interesting sort of roster component, uh, team dynamic component that that we may have to deal with down the road. But you know, functionally, they're trying to fit in a, 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 a all of the spring sports in sorry sorry all the fall sports in with the spring and not overwhelm what the spring championship cycle normally is. And so, you know, uh, potentially starting games in February, which, you know, that's, that's an interesting uh, ask for weather. You know, if you're playing Providence in February, you're, you're glad they have a turf field now for, for all the old players who used to go to Providence and that, that old grass field, you, you couldn't do that in the past, but um, you know, how we're going to put that schedule together. We actually have a meeting tomorrow with the Big East coaches to start talking about, well, how do we start structuring, what the spring will actually look like functionally with when we play games, where we play games and, uh, uh, you know, and, and then the championship being in uh, fundamentally in May. Um, so there's some, there's some pluses to it, but you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, getting, getting a competitive season uh, in place for these guys is, is um, I, I'm, I'm happy that the NCAA has gotten to that position because there wasn't, it wasn't a foregone yeah. conclusion they were going to get there um, four, three, four months ago. Rio, how big of a boost has it been for the guys that there's at least some clarity? Hey, there could be a 32 team tournament. There could be a national championship in the middle of May. How, how big a deal has that been? Um, I think it's a big deal. I think regardless of what was going to happen, you know, we were all kind of talking about like having the same mindset and approaching the spring, you know, and the fall the same way that we usually would just trying to, you know, train with each other and then if we're, if we're not able to train with each other then train in the you know environments that we can train in and just continue to get better um but it's definitely a good feeling to know that there's a possibility of a season because I think we're all kind of itching to get back to playing with each other get back to seeing coach Weiss Casper Kokoda Bull and getting back on campus wow he got all four of the coaches in there he almost forgot Connor, but he was able to remember it, which is good. And Jess, and Jess, of course. <laughs> Trainer Jess. And, and Rio, Brian has talked in the past about you being not just one of the best leaders on this current team, but maybe one of the best leaders in Georgetown soccer history. And, and that says a lot, certainly with um, my partner up there. Those are big shoes to, to aspire to. But with all of the challenges that Brian mentioned and Dan has talked about and, you know, some of the team in town and not in town, what are you and the other 
seniors and captains doing to create a culture and make sure that everyone is still bought into the program, right? Because as people are away from each other, that's, that's harder and harder to do. Yeah, I think obviously like the reality is it's really difficult right now to kind of um, think about that and create that culture. Um, I think a really big plus for us is um, along with myself, Derek Dodson and Sean Zawatsky are down here um, in DC with me. Um, we have a group of maybe like 10 to 15 guys um, training down here. And I think, you know, throughout, throughout quarantine and the summer, we were trying to have weekly meetings with each other, catch up um, and some other things. Um, and I think, you know, the most important thing is to kind of just stay in contact with each other um, and make sure everybody's on the same page in terms, not just in terms of like soccer and everything, but in terms of school and, you know, being safe with quarantine and, you know, with all the, the protests and uprising going on um, in the country throughout quarantine um, in the summer. So I think just making sure everybody's on the same page um, going forward and, and kind of having that same mindset um, of just approaching every day um, as we go. And then, you know, hopefully we can be back together as soon as possible. Rio, we talked about mental fitness, but I'm curious, of the 10 to 15 guys in D.C., how many showed up in the physical fitness level that you would have wanted them to as one of their captains? <laughs> um, that's a tough question. I think, no, honestly, guys were, were really fit um, the moment we got here. Obviously, you know, game fitness is a different story, but, um, you know, we have a really responsible team and a really committed team in terms of um, preparation. So I, I, I would say that guys, you know, when we got here early September, late August, guys were, you know, training fit, ready to go. Um, and we kind of just started training and getting after it um, from the get go. So yeah, I think, you know, I think considering all circumstances, I think guys were, were in, in really good shape. I'll translate that to 50% coach. <laughs> That's how I hear that answer. Uh, Rio, one of the things that I think a lot of us have been reflecting on for months and a lot of us Hoyas for weeks in the wake of Coach Thompson's passing has been um, the intersection of race and athletics in society, the intersection of race and athletics at Georgetown. Um, I know you've been personally very involved in the Black Student Athlete Committee um, that's engaged at the university. And I know you and the team have actually systematically gone through over the last eight weeks and educated yourselves about a bunch of issues related to race in the country. I, I think the whole group would benefit from hearing your perspective, um, given your own personal involvement, and then sharing a little about what the team has been up to to this end. Yeah, so firstly, in terms of Coach John Thompson, I think for those who know him, I think he was a pioneer in terms of, you know, civil and social issues, in terms of active activism with civil and social issues. Um, and he really paved the way for not just like college athletes and college coaches, but, you know, pro coaches, pro athletes, you know, speaking out um, through sports, um, connected to sports, so all that kind of stuff. So um, he was obviously a very um, powerful person in terms of that. And, and, you know, I'm really grateful for what he did because he, kind of created a platform for me and my peers um, this year to create BSEC um, and, and do all the stuff we're doing with them. Um, and then on the team, you know, I think it's important at a time like this and, you know, throughout quarantine, throughout the summer, I think it's important that everybody understands their roles and the roles that they have to play. And every other, everybody understands the fact that everyone has a role to play. Um, and so what we were doing with the team, with our, um, little campaign and with our um, statement that we put out and there's going to be a video hopefully really soon. You know, I think we were just playing our role, you know, and I think not only our team, but I think other Georgetown teams kind of caught on to that. And, you know, you saw statements and actions by pro teams and stuff. So I think at, at, at this point, it's just understanding the role that we all have to play because um, I think everybody has, has that role to play um, and then filling that role as best we can. So that's, that's mainly what we, you know, what I wanted to do and what, what we wanted to do as a team as well. Yeah, and, and I think, I think um, 
you know, the, the, the thing that the, the team has done, I actually, I, the, you know, when you talk about Coach Thompson, um, it's, it's, it's really interesting to me that the things he was doing and advocating for and talking about the issues that, he, that were sort of paramount to him um, when he talks about uh, black coach opportunities, um, you know, he, he, he was talking about these things 30, almost 40 years ago. And we're still talking about the exact same things today. You know, we're still trying to move the needle. And, and I think it's, you know, I think the opportunity that we have is in education and, and is in, in, in activity. And I think Rio and, 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 a, and a core group of his teammates have really pushed that um, narrative for our group. And, and I'm, I'm very, very proud of, of what Rio and, and those guys have done um, to, to really do some research, and educate themselves, educate each other. Um, and I think it's a, it, it'll be um, good to see some of those things that they've been doing. Um, but, you know, it, and, and in, in fairness, it's been a really good um, uh, catalyst for things for them to stay unified. I think they've been, it's been something they've been very serious about over the last two months uh, working on. And, and, uh, it, and it's been a good thing for them um, in, from, from, a, from a, a unity point, unity point of view. Rio, Rio, let's go back to last year um, on the field for a second. H how many times have you personally rewatched the national championship game? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yes, you are. Um, I've no, I haven't watched it too many times. You know, it's it's come today. Up on, it's <laughs> today. <laughs> it's come up on TV a couple of times, and you know the guys will text and say you know, the game's on ESPN and we'll all watch together or something like that. I'd say I've, I've watched it probably like five times in total. Who do you think's watched it the most of anybody on the team and who thinks they played better than they actually did when you watch it on replay? <laughs> um, to answer your second question, I know he's not on here right now, but I'd say Jacob Montez probably thought he played <laughs> really well. Um, I mean, he did play well. All the boys played well. Um, and then who's watched it the most? Probably, I, I would guess maybe like Foster or, or Aiden. Um, I would have guessed Aiden. Yeah, yeah, probably Rocha just to watch his penalty celebration over and over again. Well, it's, it, on ESPN, they tend to cut out the part where Aiden almost scored to win the national championship and would have made Riley Strassner the greatest hero in Georgetown soccer history. They tend yeah. to overlook that part. Yeah, they also they also missed Daniel Wu's penalty, which was disappointing. But they got it in the replay, so that's how well I know the game. So obviously, I've watched <laughs> it a couple times. <laughs> was Rio for those who haven't memorized the game, like Foster and Aiden, you had a big role in the second goal. Um, and Connor says that he designed that free kick play like exactly that way the day before and Riviere hit the ball at the exact spot and you backheaded it to Wu who scored his first goal, I think in five or six years. Um, is Connor telling the truth or recreating history? Um, if, if I can't remember exactly, but I do know that Connor was drawing up some sort of, you know, weird set piece plays. And when, when we got the free kick, we kind of just, you know, one of the set piece plays was like me and Nealis will will run, and Nelson is on this or Nealis is on this call, so he can maybe speak to this too. But we'll run front like front post, they'll hit it, and then we'll have you know a couple of guys coming across to to get second balls, and you know we ran it up and it worked. So that was that was definitely an exciting moment. And hopefully Connor draws up some plays to have you be the main target because if I read correctly, you scored like 45 or 50 goals in your high school career. Is Coach Weiss holding you back on those uh, restarts? <laughs> high school soccer is definitely a different, definitely a different story. But um, yeah, Connor, I know you're on this call, so get me some, get me some goals next season. I would, <laughs> I would really appreciate that. <laughs> so Brian, uh, Rio mentioned Dylan. I'm curious how much soccer – are you watching more soccer now um, that we're in this situation? And if so, you know, what teams are you watching? What players are you watching? I, I find myself, you know, watching a lot of Keegan and Dylan too much, many of my family members would say. 
but, center back and right back? <laughs> yes, exactly. And, uh, but curious, you know, are you watching soccer? Are you trying to make yourself better as a coach in this time? And if so, how? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm built, I mean, I'm sort of built on relationships. So if like Keegan's playing or, 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 or Dylan's playing, um, I'm very interested in those games. And, and Alex Muel, who's now with uh, um, uh, Nashville. Nashville, you know, like I, I sort of check to see if they're playing. And if they're not, I'm, I, tend, I tend not to, to sit and watch too much of those. Um, I'm waiting for a char to get healthy again to get interested in Toronto. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's – I was actually I was having a lot of fun um, watching the the Liverpool Leeds game for the second time um, because there's elements of both of those teams that really resonate uh, with with the things that I like. Um, Leeds is actually a ton of fun. So if you're if you're trying to find a team to root for this year, Leeds would be a great one to pick up as a as sort of an up and coming new new team into the Premier League. Um, but just in terms of how they think and, 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 and press and, and how they solve problems and all those things. It, it's, you know, I, I tend to get interested in teams that um, might mirror what I think our team can become uh, with the personnel we have and what we're going to be trying to do. And, and then I become huge aficionados of, of that group, whatever, whatever it is. And so, um, you know, that's the, that's the funny thing about uh, this, this thing is we've hit, we've had to hit a huge pause button you know, on, on uh, what our team is actually going to be, what we're going to look like. I mean, you know, the reality is, is we have um, uh, eight seniors, I think it is real. I think we have eight seniors, uh, or sorry, nine seniors, nine seniors, eight of whom are on pace to graduate in December. And so, you know, we have, we have a lot of question marks about, well, what does that mean for each of those players? Are they, are, are, are some of them going to be done in December and, and not, be with us in the spring are, are they going to be people going to be doing grad work are they going to slow down and take an extra class to figure out how to compete in the spring with us we, we don't know a lot of that and we probably won't know a lot of that until uh, maybe December or January and so you know um, you know if Rio decides he's going to pop off and and try to be a pro somewhere and and do this then that changes maybe how we think about our group um, uh, versus if Rio's in then we can start working on some of these set pieces we've been designing for the last <laughs> six months right so um, all of those questions are, are very much up in the air, but, uh, I, 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 um, yeah, I, I watch, I actually found I watched a ton of soccer last fall, um, and was watching a lot more, um, uh, games, uh, just because uh, I was trying to sort of figure out how the heck our team was going to function, um, over the run of it. And then you become fans of some of these teams. So, uh, with everything starting up, yeah, I think it's, it's, I have to binge watch something. So it might as well be soccer right now. And, and Brian, I don't know if you caught in Dan's question, he asked you if you're trying to get yourself better. I guess he missed that part that you flew to another continent to embed yourself with a professional program, but we'll let that one pass by the way. The one piece of advice that I would have for the seniors is, look, we all want more stars and they have a great opportunity to get another star and there would be nothing better than taking one class in the spring, still graduating from Georgetown and playing for a national championship. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I, I do think even for the players that have pro opportunities, they, they do like each other so much, it's going to be hard for them to, to not to pass on that opportunity to play together again. You know, I think that's emotionally a hard thing for them uh, to do that. And, you know, the, I mean, the, rea the reality is, is, is we would have been a consensus and, and um, you know, st still are in some ways, uh, number one team in the country coming into the season, whatever that season is. And, you know, I've always talked about with that, with the group, it's like, that's a, that's a totally different challenge for this group to try to figure out and, and navigate. And, and the fun of that is, is something that I think would be, I think this group in particular would be um, up for and would be a lot of fun to see them, to see them try to figure it out. Right. Can you talk about uh, the bizarreness of recruiting in this moment? You know, as you and I've talked about, there's a couple dimensions that make it bizarre. First is, um, you're sort of not allowed to see, see games. But the second is with all these variables of people getting extra years of eligibility and not knowing who's going to be here, how are you and the staff navigating the complexity? You shared with this group on the last time we had a town hall that you don't love watching video mm -hmm. as, a way to, as a way to see players, but that's about the only way to see players right now. 
No, I, I don't love watching video. Um, and, and, but it is something that we've had to adapt to from a recruiting point of view. We haven't been able to see anybody play in person since March. And so there's a huge amount of, of games and opportunities that, that, that we just have been missing for that purpose. Um, uh, you know, Rio's a really good example of a kid that I saw. I saw Rio and Jack Beer, who are teammates with the New York Soccer Club, play in um, uh, the Maryland Soccer Plex over, over I think it was, Potom it was a, a Memorial Day weekend. And my, my old assistant, uh, Brian Gill, who's now the head coach at Penn, had, had done the grunt work and seen those guys play like on a Saturday and then said, hey, uh, see if you can pop over and watch them on Sunday. I like this Jack Beer. He sort of mentioned Rio. It's like, yeah, maybe <laughs> I should watch him too. But I really like this Jack Beer guy. He's really fun. And then there's a couple other guys on the team. And so I, I, was, I sat and I watched them play a couple of times. And, and you do, you, you, it's amazing what you pick up when you see people play in person, right? You, and it's the interactions of how they handle their teammates. It's the interactions of how they um, handle their coaches, referees, that you just, it's, it's very tricky to figure out on film. Um, and actually, there's a video that I think we were going to try to show on, on Rio that hopefully a lot of people have seen before, um, but we'll try to get up. Uh, for you guys to see it's a great piece on Rio's about a minute long and I think we made it two years ago um, and you know it talks about the character that he has and it, I, I and the story I was telling about Rio was when we lost his freshman year we lost in on an own goal in overtime to SMU and our, uh, we had a center back that sort of accidentally headed in our own goal and you know our season ends and Rio who was registering the year he hadn't played a minute uh, and was a freshman he went sprinting over to our, our center back who was abject on the ground and was trying to, you know, uh, get him to stand up and, and sort of move, move forward and, and was, was, the, was the guy who was most worried about him. And that, that stuff, you know, it's great to see that, but it, 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 it's also stuff that you kind of can glean ahead of time. So it, my long answer, uh, Dan, to your question is um, we don't know what we need. You know, we talk about this with recruits, right? We're talking to um, juniors now, and we've seen a lot of video on these guys. And I'm pretty upfront with them. And I say, I don't know. I have no idea positionally what we need for your year. So don't ask me if you're going to be a starter or not. And we never say that anyway. But it's like, we, we don't know. We have no idea. So we are, we are legitimately just trying to figure out who are the kids we like a lot. So, you know, we, we, we space out our phone calls with our, our coaches. And I told our, our, my, our, my, my coaches to be like, Tell me who are the ones that you really enjoyed your conversation with? Who are the ones that you, you had the best conversations with? And, and then we'll start really looking in harder into those videos because we have to get the character right. And if you're not seeing it on the video, you, you know, that's a big piece to it is, is, is the character piece. And so who do we like the conversations with? Um, how much video can we watch on that kid? And, uh, and, and we, just, we just want the player to be good, right? So if they're good, and ideally versatile, that's great. But if they're good and, and could play, have the ability to play as a freshman, that's great. But we'll tell them that we have no idea what we're going to need and they have to be okay with that. And then, and then we'll go from there. So it's, it's, it's a lot of shooting in the dark. Um, but you, you, you want to make sure you're, you're picking up on a couple consistent traits for each of the kids you're trying to get. And, and Brian, you talked about the potential for additional eligibility and the unknowns of maybe some guys have an opportunity that they can't pass up in the spring you've never had a large roster with a lot of red shirts you know, Danny and I are getting ready to call games. We'll look down and, you know, we'll see 10 or 11 players on some of the teams in the big East that are red shirt players. So question for you. And then question for Rio about that is, do you envision in this kind of new environment, having larger rosters and maybe guys red shirt a, and then B for, for Rio, for you, what did you learn in that red shirt year? It's much different when you're training every day, but knowing you're not going to play. And I'm curious about that experience that you had during that campaign. Rio, why don't you go first? Yeah. So yeah, I redshirted freshman year. Um, it was, it was definitely, I mean, and I, I feel like I can speak to all people who, who redshirt their freshman years or, or, you know, injury red shirts or whatever it may be. It, it was definitely difficult, you know, at first, um, especially at like a program like Georgetown, you know, a very top tier program, everybody being recruited and coming in is, you know, one of the better players on their teams and used to playing and used to, you know, all the attention and all that kind of stuff. So it's definitely hard kind of getting used to, oh, maybe I'm not going to play, you know, this game or maybe I'm not going to play this year at all. Um, but I think it's important. And this is what helped me was just in my mindset, 
you know, having a lot of conversations with, with Weiss and, and the other coaches at the time, just like imagining, you know, the, the coming years. And I think, you know, all, all the work you put in, regardless of whether you're playing or not, is, is, you know, work improving yourself and learning more about the game and the system that you're playing in and all that kind of stuff. So um, once I kind of shifted my focus onto that, I feel like I was in a better mental state. Um, and I feel like I could, you know, work harder and work, work better for myself to improve myself and then find my way into the team um, the next year and the, the years after that as well. Yeah, and, and I just want to remind Rio that with the NCAA granting yet another year of eligibility, he could be in his 30s and still be playing. <laughs> for the team. So uh, he actually technically has three seasons to play if he wants. So he could, get, he could be getting his PhD and still playing if, if, he, if he chose. So. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's the, 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 the red shirt, the red shirt, you know, kind of concept is, is going to be interesting. I don't know how many will have, I think you will have some, and it's going to be case to case. It's going to be depend on the kid, um, and the situation for him. But I think what you will have is you will have a lot of, of graduate school student players that will either stay on to do the red shirt or will move to a different program and have one to two years to be a grad student somewhere. Um, and yeah. so you'll see a lot of players that move across different teams, which will be a very different kind of a thing that the prevalence of that will be, I think, um, pretty high, uh, moving forward. All right. I'm going to go to the audience here. Um, I'm going to go to Greg DeLuca in, uh, South Carolina. The reason DeLuca, not only a huge fan, but he's an attorney in the Carolinas and he's had this same background as he has served his clients for the last six months with the Georgetown uh, National Championship. So Deluxe, you deserve a chance to ask either Rio or Brian a question. You're on mute, Gregory. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, it's, it's, he's a lawyer. Yeah, he's got to be, I don't know, this is the problem with lawyers. We can't in. Greg, you're gonna have to type your question. You're gonna have to chat it. You're gonna have yeah, to chat. Yeah, use the, the chat. Type. Yeah. So if anyone has questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. There goes my, uh, you know, ad lib opportunity. Hey, um, Brian, what, uh, I know you guys have made some decisions and they've been tough decisions about how to celebrate the national championship, um, rings and, uh, you know, other, other things about the national championship you want to share with the community, what you guys came up with? Yeah, it's, it's, um, we've been, we had, we actually had a, a national championship celebration banquet, uh, planned on April 27th or something like that, um, last spring. And then everything got shut down and, and we were hopeful that we would do it for a preseason. We'd hope, we were hoping that we'd, we've been sort of pushing it back forever. And our guys are getting upset because, um, they want these rings. Uh, it's so, uh, uh, we, we decided to do a, um, a zoom event. Actually, I think it should be pretty good. We've been planning it for a little while. It's going to be up September 28th. Everyone is welcome. Um, I think it's five o'clock on the 28th, which is a Monday. Um, and the guys are going to get their rings. Um, uh, Lee Reed will be on, uh, President DeJoy is coming on, uh, pending his schedule, but it sounds like he's planning on trying to come on. Um, you know, last time I saw him, we were we were hugging on the on the field and carry. So he's got to, you know, we 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 have to reunite over those moments again digitally. <laughs> um, so, uh, but there's some videos. We got major awards. It, it'll be a really nice night. I think it'll be a really good uh, a, a event. So um, that's I know some that's something the guys have been itching for is these these oversized rings they're waiting on uh, to 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 have on their Zoom Zoom class calls. Okay, Greg DeLuca checking in. How are the incoming freshmen handling things? Um, you know, uh, everyone has a difficult thing here, but getting used to class from abroad, hoping to be, you know, joining their teammates, many of whom they've never met before, and now being in this situation, how are they handling it? Well, I'll, I'll start, and then Rio, can, if he can chime in, because he's talking to him at a different level than I am. I talk at him, and then they sort of nod and, and – uh, um, but, you know, they, there was a time when it was just going to be freshmen coming on campus. It was just a freshman uh, um, experience at Georgetown, and then they made the decision to shut down campus entirely. And I actually think that was a really good decision for the freshmen because, you know, if you think of – and all of, all of you guys who are, who are Georgetown alums, the, the, 
the quality that Georgetown brings when they do orientation is, 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 is fantastic. And, and to, to have the chance for them to have their actual freshman orientation be, even though it's in January, but have it maybe with the rest of the student body and to do a proper orientation with that sort of that, that, that energy, I think is, is worth waiting for versus, you know, something where it's just them and, and they're heavily quarantined in their rooms and, you know, the experience a lot of these universities are having has been really tough, really punitive for, for, for these kids trying to figure out how to socially interact and, and that time. So um, it's, it's the right choice for those guys. And I think, I think they've been handling it as well as you could hope. You know, I, I, I've been very impressed in, in dealing with, you know, talking to them. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's frustrating because like, it's the most exciting thing that you have is that transition from high school to college and it's just they, they just have to keep pushing back and waiting so I, Rio you've talked to some guys I don't, you've been around some of the guys I don't know how you what your thoughts are yeah I think I mean you kind of said it I think they've been handling it the best that we could have hoped I think you know this is a situation that none of us have ever experienced before and none of us really know like how to solve it or the right thing to do so what we the players who have been on the team are you know trying to do is just you know, figure out the best way to be there for the freshmen, any questions they have or, you know, about school or about training or lifting or any of that kind of stuff. But um, I, I do think they're handling it in a, in a really good way. And for the ones that are at home training, you know, on USL teams or whatever, um, they're getting good fitness and good training in. And then the ones who, who are here training with us, they're, they're um, you know, getting to know us better and, and getting good fitness and good training with us. So I, I think they've handled it really well. Um, and, and I hope they, you know, keep that strong mentality and just continue to do so until we can all be back together. Yeah. And Brian, with all of these challenges and uncertainties that are out there, there is a, there is real cost to the university and to the program. And, um, over the years, there's been a lot of support from alumni that got a lot better and bigger after the national championship. But as we sit here today, what can alumni and supporters of the program do and how important is it right now for people to really support and be involved with the program? Yeah, it, you know, it's, um, it's a good question, Tom, cause it, cause it's, it's hugely critical with, with where we are and, and, um, what our, our needs are and, and what the, the, the athletic department's needs are, you know, things change in terms of priorities. Georgetown and, and Lee Reed have done an amazing job with sort of the, 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 the holistic support of our athletes, all right, with adding sports psychologists, nutritionists, um, uh, it, 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 the, 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 the entire sort of infrastructure to support. We, we have four coaches and then I would say our athletic trainer, Jess, and our, our, our um, strength and conditioning coach, that group of six people see our players all the time. And that's, like, that's like your core sort of group of support. But then there's this whole other sort of uh, supplementary support group that we've been adding to. And, you know, you, you want to talk about, and I've said this a lot. I mean, I think we spend a ton of time talking about COVID. What's, what's our situation with COVID? How are we keeping the kids um, and the community healthy and safe and, and, um, and the thing that we're, we're not really sure what to do when I say we, I'm talking about just even nationally, um, is, well, what do we, how do we handle the mental health side of these things? Right. How do we, I mean, you know, the, the statistics are pretty scary with the increases of anxiety and depression in college AIDS kids and, and rightly so, uh, and we need to solve those things. And so the priorities of the university and the athletic department are going to shift and evolve with this as well. So, you know, I know one of the priorities for the athletic department is, is we need another mental health expert in the athletic department uh, to, to deal with, I mean, uh, you know, Dr. Erica Force is, is in now and she's a single entity dealing with 700 athletes. And she be pre COVID was, was working, you know, uh, um, outrageous hours to try to accommodate everyone's needs. I can only imagine what those needs are going to be when we come back. And so I know that the athletic department has said, we need to, you know, um, you know, to, to, to get another position put in. That's a huge priority. And then at the end of the day, you know, the university is going to need support in, in a way that maybe they've never needed it before. Um, and, you know, the, the, now's not the time. If, if you are still able to give, we're, we're going to need the support. You know, our program, the athletic department, the university, 
um, you know, they're, I've been very impressed with how our president's office has handled the needs of the athlete, of the, of the students in general. Uh, and um, they've been, they've put, they've put well, well-being and wellness ahead of cost containment. Um, and, you know, at some point we're going to, we, as, as a program, when you, when you sort of filter it all down, we're going to be hit with, we can't operate how we've been used to operating. And, you know, we need, we, we're going to need as much support from our community as, as possible to, to, to do the things that we're going to need to do. Cause you know, to be honest, next spring, the things that we think are going to be most important are things that we maybe haven't even thought of yet. Uh, because of where we are with COVID and the, and the, and the athletes coming back and what are, what, what those challenges are. So um, I, I, I think I may have said this the first time, it's like, you know, don't, don't turn your back on Georgetown right now. It's, it's, it's in huge need for support from, from everyone who can. Uh, and, and I think those asks will be coming once the university knows more and more about what the real needs are. Um, I think there's, I think they're still trying to figure out exactly where the, where the big, the big holes are going to be. But I know for the athletic department, it's, it's operating, you know, trying to trying to keep ourselves above um, our heads above water, and then that the the, the uh, sports psychologist position at adding another mental health piece there is going to be hugely important. All right, so we're going to do a speed round to close based on questions that have either come into my phone or on the chat here. Rio, um, number one rival, number one team you consider a rival today. Um. Really quickly, I would have to say, I'd have to say uh, Providence, maybe, or Xavier. I mean, Providence gives us more, more of a competitive game, but I've, I've lost more games in my Georgetown career to, to Xavier than I've won. So those are, they're definitely my biggest, my biggest rival, personally. It's, it's one of the interesting things, because, Tommy, you wouldn't have said Providence or obviously Xavier no. years ago. No, and Brian wouldn't have said either as well. We asked him a similar question, and he kind of deferred. So I like the honesty from Rio. Yeah, exactly. I like to think that we're everyone else's rival. That's sort of the difficulty of the, of the, of the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly. that's why I'm going to throw that out there, yeah. And a quick follow-up, Rio. The best player, attacking player, you've had to defend in college soccer? Ooh, I, I, Daryl DK for Virginia was, was – definitely my hardest task yeah and he's he's proven to be a hard task for many defenders who are making millions of dollars uh in the mls right now yeah he just won mls player of the month who do you struggle with in training defending <laughs> he's definitely saying something right now Derek. but i'm not gonna yeah, go ahead and say it yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, I'll say, I'll say either Derek Dotson or Paul Rothrock. Paulie sometimes just gets oh, me with speed on. and Dottie gets me with his fake strength and positioning. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, da Derek, if you're still with us, um, what would you say about Rio's chief weakness as a defender that you're easily able to exploit in training? Whatever he says is not true. He, not true. he, he thinks he's stronger than he is, so he likes to get a little physical, so it's easy to spin him. I love it. We'll see. We'll see about that in training tonight, Daddy. We'll see. Well, I mean, I saw something happen in training yesterday, so. <laughs> uh, I think I saw Aiden Rocha. Aiden, uh, would you evaluate Rio or Derek as physically stronger on the field? Most definitely. Watching them go at it, uh, I could you not, every day is not only comical, but inspiring, too. That was a good non-answer. It was a great non-answer. Yeah. Sophomore, that was diplomatic. That's smart. Um, Brian, we obviously talked about the state of the season at the beginning. Some people joined us late. I'll frame the question very directly. You know, people saw the Big Ten announcement that they're likely to have a mid-fall start to at least football sort of silent on other sports. Um, the conversation at the beginning suggested all the Big East energy is on a season in the spring. Is there anything you could see that could move that forward? No, no, I don't think so. I think there's too much planning that needs to go in. I think everything's centered around a championship. So the NCAA, the reason why 
95 uh, percent of the of the Division One men's soccer teams decided to move to the spring is because the championship is now moved to the spring. Everyone wants a national uh, NCAA national championship uh, competition uh, put in. So um, there's there, there's no real reason to rush it. Uh, and to be fair, you also see I know football is doing their own thing, but the the teams that are trying to play in the fall, men's and women's, a lot of them are having a hard time get, having their games come off. You, you'll see yeah. a certain percentage of them are getting postponed or canceled. And, you know, it, the logistics are still not quite there to, to, to run it smoothly. So I don't, I don't see anything happen until uh, spring. Okay, a couple more questions. Pat McArdle um, wrote this one, which I think is great. And Alfredo Montero, uh, I see you. If you can hear us and get off mute. Pat wanted to know, um, and as longtime Georgetown supporters know, uh, Mr. Montero was the first ever inductee from soccer into the Georgetown Hall of Fame. Did you ever imagine um, that we would one day be the best college team in the nation and actually probably the best college team in the world, given the state of university soccer in the U.S. <laughs> versus other places? I like the well, way you say that, yeah. Truly, truly, uh, back in 1969, we were the best team in the nation. We were just not recognized as one. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to wait, what, 40 years or so to actually be recognized. But what I'm really impressed is not just the, the championship. It's over the years, the last 20, 30 years has been so impressive watching the, 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 the progress of the program. And to hear uh, all of you guys talk about having five or six coaches and the holistic approach we didn't have that in 1969. We just had to play and we did well. So thanks for uh, bringing me into the conversation. Yeah. It's a beautiful sentiment. And for those who haven't um, been on campus, the next time you are, the Athletic Hall of Fame is in the corner of uh, I know. the floor in the Levy Center. And we're slowly adding more men's soccer uh, yeah. you know, alums every, uh, every decade or so. So I'm sure that will uh, I'm sure that will continue. So Brian, I think it's kind of like the Super Bowl. We call it the World Champions. I actually think we should be now referring to ourselves as the World uh, University Champions. I, I I think listen, we we we've done that in baseball here as a country. I think there's no yeah. reason there's no reason that we can't carry that over to 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 soccer for for men and women. In fairness, I think that'd be appropriate. And then Brian Warren Vanderweg asking the extremely important question not planted with you know with Tom and I at the top of our games in the broadcast booth what's the status of our you know contract are we locked in um, obviously there was some you know disappointment about us not being able to call the final four games which has led to you know a lot of anxiety in the community any announcements well, as as, as I, I had this discussion with with Tom uh, earlier, there was there was a uh, salary multiplier put in place for this fall. Um, unfortunately, you know, since this the things have been moved to the spring, I don't think that's valid any longer. So I think you'll be on your same contract. It, it's always year to year, and in fact, game to game, um, <laughs> based on based on what you may or may not what you may or may not say. I think. Uh, um, you know, I, here's, here's one of the things I really miss. I miss seeing our team. I really miss seeing our players, uh, seeing everybody going. But I, the other thing I really miss is going back the night of, of our game, sitting down and, and only having the copy of our game, that's the broadcast copy, and having to listen to Dan and Tom critique the hell out of all of the substitutions we're making and, and what we're doing, what we should be doing, our corner kicks need to be completely revamped. I miss I miss those moments with my tea, sitting with a hot tea and listening to the, the two Muppets in the balcony going crazy on the team at, 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 in in the thing. So I'm hoping that comes back in the spring. So I, I listen. I'm I, you know I'm not the wrong person to talk to about contracts and, and what it is, but um, I, I think I think listen. I think you're only getting better. I, th I feel like ESPN is on the cusp of of, of offering something for a, for a college cup broadcast at some point. But he, he did finally admit that he listens to us, Danny. That's a big step because for the last 10 years, the coaching staff has adamantly denied that they listen to what we say. But the next game, it's apparent they, they listen to <laughs> some of the advice. I did. I talked to one of the assistant, a former assistant coach of a Big East team last week on a completely separate matter. And the biggest compliment he paid is he said, we were the only 
college broadcast in the country that they listened to with the sound on when, when they watched one of the Georgetown games. So we'll uh, probably it, because we're giving out inside information. About that, that's, a, that's a legitimate challenge with you two is that you, <laughs> you actually are the few, two of the few people that know the sport well enough to actually talk sense during the game. And, and you tend to know us so well that you'll, 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 you'll pretty quickly concede who our best aerial targets are on set pieces. Yeah. Uh, who's got, who doesn't have a left foot or who doesn't have a right foot. These are the things that they'll take notes on. So, but you know, whatever, whatever you need for your ratings, you guys just keep going. That's okay. Well, Derek, Derek just told the entire country for strikers how to get around Rio. So, I mean. <laughs> so Brian, uh, we'll give you, uh, actually we'll give Rio the last word um, tonight and Rio on behalf of the whole community, um, deep thanks both for being with us tonight, but you on behalf of the team, but you as an individual leader have, um, meant a lot to the university, to your peers across all the sports in the way that you've shown up um, over the last six months. And it makes us all proud to be, to be part of the program. So I'll let you have the last word to the, the Georgetown soccer family tonight. Um, well, um, thank you for that. Um, I guess I, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, thank you guys for inviting me on the call. Um, and I, I would just say, let's, let's keep, you know, Let's let's keep a a strong a strong mentality in terms of you know hoping for the best things to come in the future in terms of soccer and then in terms of um, our country as well and um, you know there's a lot there's a lot still to be done um, in terms of you know racial awareness and racial equality um, so let's keep fighting for that and let's let's keep playing playing our parts and and filling our roles so. Thanks everybody for being here. Get out, get out and vote, and we'll see you guys on the 28th of September for the, the ring ceremony. And for big soccer supporters, Coach Nolan has his coach's corner tomorrow, I believe. So look at look for the, the invite from the university for that. And Keegan kicks off in an hour or so. So um Tune on and see the, the best right back in Georgetown history take on FC Dallas. All right. See you, everybody. Thanks for coming, everybody.